The final chain of events that ultimately led to the explosion of Chernobyl Unit 4 in 1986 was set in motion when Leonid Toptonov pressed the AZ-5 button. However, let's envision a scenario where Akimov doesn't order Toptonov to shut down the reactor, and instead tells him to wait for some unknown reason. That doesn't matter. Let's instead look at this scenario, because there are actually two diverging opinions here, both with similar answers. First of all, we need to take a look at the reactor at this moment in time, as the rundown program nears its end and the reactor reaches a critical moment. In the minutes leading up to the disaster, there was a great variation in multiple factors, as the operators worked to balance them before the test and set up a potentially dangerous issue. In normal conditions, water enters the core of an RBMK at approximately 265 to 270 degrees Celsius, and exits at approximately 284, containing many voids as water boils into steam. However, April 26th was different. When the power fell at around half past midnight, there was a rather large loss of water in the steam separators, which needed to be recovered. To do this, Boris Stoyachuk, the senior block control engineer, performed several sudden increases in the flow rate of feed water entering the steam separators. This would then enter the reactor and travel up. Now, this water is preheated, but only to a temperature of 165 Celsius. That's a big difference of about 100 degrees between the temperature of feed water and water returning from the core mostly as steam. So, this relatively cooler water, which is denser than the water already in the steam separators and sinks, falls to the bottom of the separators and is most of the water to enter the core. Of course, it doesn't boil at all given how cold it is, and this also means that there is a reduction in voids, causing a withdrawal of control rods. The second part is not significant for today's video, as we won't be talking about the causes of the disaster yet. Anyway, this colder water will keep cycling through the reactor core until it is close to its boiling point, but Stolyachuk did this twice. Once shortly after 1am, and once in the few minutes before the rundown began. So now we have lots of cold water, further dampening down the reactivity, and also water approaching its boiling point quite quickly. We reach a point now where the approximate temperature of coolant water entering the core is 282 degrees Celsius, about 2 degrees away from the temperature of water exiting the core. This, of course, means that there is an increase in the number of voids forming, raising the reactivity due to the positive void coefficient, and leading to an insertion of the automatic control rods again. This brings us up to speed with the last few seconds before the AZ-5 button is pressed, with the automatic control rods approaching, or at, full insertion. This is not enough to overcome the void coefficient, however. The power would continue to rise even if AZ-5 wasn't pressed, and in fact, in a rare win for Craig Mazin and the HBO TV series, it would have looked something like what we see there. Here, we have two diverging claims about what will happen but both depend on the same process, the positive void coefficient. It is a complete enigma in its behaviour, and especially on that night. Estimations of the strength of the positive void coefficient in the conditions of that night put it 50% higher than normal. Analysis at the other reactors at the Chernobyl power plant showed that the positive void coefficient reached values of 5 beta, where reaching 1 beta is the equivalent to having so much positive reactivity you end up going prompt critical. And prompt criticality is, well, the same technology that makes a fission bomb go boom. Now, in January of 1988, a scientific paper was published in Canada of all places about the RBMK. At first, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning this. But Chernobyl guy, I hear you say, the Canadians only had INSAG-1. Well, Scientists aren't unintelligent. Less than two years after the explosion, the West had already concluded that the modelling presented at Vienna was a lie. The positive scram effect, 
the rise in reactivity being due to the control rods, and not the rundown experiment itself, was well understood. The paper decided to run a few scenarios. A simulation based on the Soviet data, which you may recognise as familiar if you watch my video on the Alexander Sitch version of destruction. One where the positive void coefficient did not exist, meaning that the entirety of the power surge was caused just by control rod insertion. Their own model, which I'm ignoring because it doesn't correspond to reality. And one where no control rod insertion occurred, and so no changes in reactivity from then. Now, as you can see, over these six seconds, the reactor power barely seems to increase over the duration of the image. So there's the answer, right? No power increase. The reactor remains stable, and eventually it could be scrammed by just inserting a few control rods at a time. But this is a lie. The y-axis of the graph is logarithmic. It begins at just over 15% of reactivity, and when it concludes it is about halfway up, so about 30% of maximum reactivity. This is a doubling of the reactivity. The core voids are still forming, but it appears to be slow, and the reactor appears to be bringing itself stable regardless. And this is the camp where a few people fall into. The reactor would eventually level out and stabilise without exploding. Now, what some of you may have noticed, the reactivity here is doubling in 6 seconds. This means an automatic scram due to a low period in the reactor, and Chernobyl 4 blows itself up anyway. But assuming it didn't, then we have Camp 1 here. So, you may also be wondering, does this graph keep going forwards in time? And the answer is, of course, yes. We're starting fine, power is slowly increasing, and then at 1.2350, well, it doesn't look very good. Reactor power reaches a huge spike of 240%, and then immediately reverses back down to 140% as the high negative temperature coefficient of the reactor would have reversed the reactivity back down, before spiking again and again as the two coefficients, the negative temperature coefficient and the positive void coefficient, fought to balance each other out and reach a stable reactivity. Such a climb in reactivity would be much smaller, of course, compared to the real life situation where it approaches 100,000% reactivity and temperatures would only break 670 degrees Celsius, compared to the thousands of degrees evident in damage to the core today. What does this mean? Well, the upper biological shield, despite being this absolutely massive structure, could have been displaced by just three or four simultaneous fuel channel ruptures. And that there means another Chernobyl disaster. But in this scenario, with lower temperatures and pressures, that many fuel channel ruptures would probably not occur. And with the diesel generators almost fully started up and switched on to power the pumps, according to the rundown program, we have a new factor to consider, the sudden influx of coolant water. These series of power surges are dependent wholly on the positive void coefficient alone, and a sudden influx of coolant water would almost immediately collapse the voids and in fact reduce the reactivity inside the core. No matter what, the reactor is going to suffer a lot of stress. Damaged channels, potentially cracked graphite blocks, and a lot of fuel that will need replacement. Someone would have definitely been punished for it, like Vyacheslav Akinfiev, who was scapegoated for the Unit 1 accident and replaced with Anatoly Dyatlov. So, there's the two hypotheses. Either the reactor remains relatively stable, and a big emphasis on the relative, or there is a smaller power surge brought down by an influx of cold water that will then bring power back down to safer levels. In either case, an automatic scram signal would have almost certainly been triggered, blowing up the reactor anyway. But if there wasn't, then not pressing the AZ5 button could have in fact saved Chernobyl. One thing definitely worth appreciating to those who have brought it up as a suggestion for a video and voting in it in my most recent poll, this very question answered by today's video was instrumental in disproving the Soviet version of events decades ago. So, well done for doing your part in history and science.
to help explore the truth behind this disaster. And thank you for watching my videos. It really means a lot. Goodbye.